Sharon was dying. She had been dying for almost a year, more and more every day. The cancer was aggressive. He literally devoured her from the inside. She survived almost four months longer than doctors thought possible. But when I brought her to the hospital this time, we both knew that she would never leave here. Her breathing was ragged, short, shuddering breaths. The drip didn't help anymore. She was in a lot of pain, but she fought with all her might for one more minute of her life to be with me and our two children. But suffering. Oh God, how she suffered. I stood up from the straight-backed chair that she was allowed to place next to her bed and leaned over my wife of only a few years. I kissed her lips. I wasn't sure if she was still aware of what was happening, but maybe. Her breathing evened out for a few seconds and then became hoarse again, but now it was weaker. I leaned close to whisper in her ear, Darling, I will always love you. Your son and daughter know you love them, and they love you. We will love you forever, sweetheart. You don't have to fight anymore, sweetheart. It's time to let go. I'll take care of Tommy and Judy for you, and they'll take care of me, honey. Don't worry anymore, we'll be fine. I kissed her on the forehead and again on the lips and remained standing, leaning over. Her and stroking her emaciated arms and face. After a few seconds, she exhaled softly and did not inhale again. The monitoring equipment began to emit a loud, shrill beep, but it was telling me something I already knew. My Sharon is gone. I sat up wearily, then leaned down again to kiss her lifeless lips one last time. I patted her hand and stepped away from the hospital bed to let the doctor and nurses in. I pressed my lips together and turned away to face Sharon's mother and father. I hugged Judy, then Bruce. I stepped aside to allow them to approach the bed and say goodbye to their youngest daughter. Through my tears, I looked for the door. I walked out, going in search of my son and daughter. I had to find a way to tell a three-year-old girl and her four-year-old brother that their mother would never hold them in her arms again, that she was now with the angels and would watch over them forever. I was in a fog for a while, drowning in my grief, but trying to be the best father and mother I could be to my two young children. This meant that I had to help them overcome their grief while also dealing with my own without letting it consume us. I began to hate Anchorage, and at the same time the entire state of Alaska. My in-laws lived there, and we had a great relationship with them, but there were too many memories in that place of the places Sharon and I had been and the things we had done together. Like wounded animals seeking refuge to heal their wounds, my children and I moved home to Texas, where we would not be reminded daily of what we had lost. Bruce and Judy, my in-laws and my children's grandparents, weren't happy with my decision, but they understood. They had enough money to fly to Texas whenever they wanted. The trust fund that my great-aunt bequeathed to Sharon matured a year after Tommy was born, and the money passed to me after Sharon died. I didn't want them, I tried to return them, but my in-laws did not accept them back, and my great-aunt passed away a long time ago so I became a multimillionaire overnight. I invested the money into a business and set up two trusts, one for each of my children for school or for whatever they want to do in life. The rest was in the bank and brought in more money than the children and I could spend. Once home, my parents decided they no longer needed to travel around the country looking for the perfect RV campsite. According to the current plan, they were only going to travel in the spring and fall. Winters and summers were considered seasons when traveling was simply not as fun. They welcomed me and their grandchildren with open arms. Mom and Dad already lived in a two-room house in the north of the city and had a dacha in a hilly area. They sold the house and moved into another with four bedrooms, hinting that Tommy and Judy might want to visit them sometimes. Mom and Dad were as happy as I had ever seen them. They saw their grandchildren often and began a campaign to pamper them beyond measure. They said that this was their job. This is what grandparents should do. I just turned 36. I wasn't worried about my age. I didn't feel like time was passing me by or anything like that. I had a son and a daughter, and I worked hard to take care of them. Thomas Bruce Singletary, my son, was five, and Judith Lee was almost four. The time since Sharon's death was difficult, but she had been sick for so long. The long illness was a kind of grief even before her death. 
The children did not realize many things how could they, but they realized that their mother was no longer suffering, and that was good. It didn't make up for the loss, but it was something. I owned a business, or rather, he was a partner in business. Sharon's friend Teresa Cunningham and I were in similar roles in the business world, and I literally lured her away from my father-in-law. Teresa and I started a consulting firm that would analyze every aspect of a business and prepare a report for the owners or board of directors highlighting the company's weaknesses. Teresa managed the day-to-day -day operations, involving me only when a problem arose that required a change in policy or direction. I contributed most of the seed money from a trust fund left by Sharon. I owned 51% of the company. Teresa and her husband Carl owned the remaining 49%. Ultimately, I was going to make it easier for them to buy out my share because I didn't want to work hard and I didn't intend to work for the rest of my life. It wasn't that I was that lazy, I just wanted to spend as much time as possible raising my children. And that's exactly what I did. On a bright, sunny Texas day, my son and daughter talked me into taking them to one of those places that serves pizza that is really just good quality cardboard. To compensate, they had a variety of small games and attractions for children there. Even almost four-year-old Judy knew how to insert a token into the slot, happily watching the ride launch and clapping her hands. Only when the initial program ended did she sit on the carousel or start playing the proposed games. Sometimes I didn't quite understand what was required of the player, but my kids seemed to have an innate sense for these things. Well, they had fun, and that was the main thing. I sat in one of the semicircular booths and watched my children, who were just a few feet away from me on one of the rides, a four-foot carousel that spun at a pace that seemed unbearably slow to me. I would be incredibly bored if I rode it myself, but they seemed to like her. I helped them onto the ride, then walked around the barrier and got back on. Of course, I was armed. My .45 Glock 38 was always with me, and I took my responsibility to protect children from any threats seriously. I looked around at the other bored parents and waited for the specially ordered pizza, hoping it would be at least a little better than the one under the lamps on the buffet table. When the carousel stops, the kids will join me to help eat the pizza I specially ordered or choose something from the buffet. I was sure that they would choose the second option instead of eating what their father chose. I looked at their happy faces and involuntarily smiled. Sharon will never be forgotten, but we did our best to cope with her absence. It's been almost a year since she died. Hello, cowboy. I heard a woman's voice. Is there room for a couple of girls? I wore a Stetson hat outside, now it was lying next to me on the plastic seat, so the word cowboy wasn't too strange. But why would anyone? And then I recognized this soft contralto. I turned my head sharply and saw a woman, a beautiful woman, and a little girl standing at my shoulder. Oh my God, I whispered, Mercedes. I immediately jumped to my feet and found myself face to face with a beautiful woman with jet black hair and bright blue eyes. I didn't even remember how I got up. She smiled tentatively and then with more confidence. I didn't know whether to hug her. I wanted to, but I knew that she got married many years ago. Yes, I read in a magazine that she was getting divorced, but I wasn't sure if it was true. Hi, Matt, she said softly. She came towards me and kissed me softly on the lips, and that solved my dilemma. I almost hugged her to kiss her back with interest. My hands touched her elbows, and without noticing it, I pulled her closer, to which she readily responded with another kiss. I would never do anything with a married woman, and she probably remembered my attitude on this matter from the times when we were together. On the other hand, she didn't act like a married woman. Someone pulled my knee. I stepped back a few inches from Mercedes and looked down at the most adorable girl in the world, except for my little Judy, of course. I couldn't help but smile. She wasn't shy at all and smiled back at me. Are you my mom's friend? She asked in a sweet, childish voice. I crouched down to be at her level. I always found it rude when adults talked to children while literally looking down on them. I think so, I assured her. There was no doubt she was a small copy of Mercedes. Are you my friend? she asked. Forever and ever, 
I replied. Little Mercedes smiled happily, moved closer, and kissed me on the cheek. I couldn't help but hug her and kiss her back. What's your name, honey? I asked. Madia, she replied in her small voice. But you can call me Maddie. I was shocked. It was clearly a feminine derivative of my name. But was it an accident? I glanced at Mercedes. She smiled and nodded. She named her daughter after me. I was a little taken aback by this. Mercedes said silently, then, I definitely needed to know how it happened. How old are you, Maddie? I asked, because this was the second question that adults always ask children. Three, she answered quickly. She had difficulty showing three fingers on her right hand and ended up using her left hand to hold back her unruly little finger. I stood up and looked around for my children. Just in time, yes, the ride they were on stopped, and they jumped off, looking at me and the two strangers next to me with interest. I turned to face them as they ran towards me and squatted down again. Tommy, Judy, I'd like to introduce you to my old friends. This is Mercedes, and her daughter Maddie. The children stood there, a little embarrassed, not knowing what to do. I quickly diffused the situation by inviting everyone to go grab some pizza from the buffet and refresh their drinks, something simple to keep them occupied. Judy immediately wanted to investigate the ice cream machine, but I gave her a stern look. She knew she shouldn't, but she decided to try her luck like all children, testing the boundaries. A few minutes later, all three children were sitting on one side of the booth, munching on cardboard pizza and chatting among themselves as if they had known each other all their lives. They started kicking under the table just to hear a thud. I think people who kick the table don't get ice cream, I casually remarked. The knocking immediately stopped. While the pizza was being served, Mercedes ended up in the seat next to me on our side of the semicircular booth. At first there was enough space, but soon she moved closer. We sat side by side, our arms and thighs touching each other. It didn't bother me at all, on the contrary, I liked it, but I didn't have time to ask a couple of questions, I began, like, what are you doing here, and something like that. I thought this would help start a conversation. It didn't occur to me to keep my voice down so only Mercedes could hear. We were looking for you, Maddie responded immediately, pointing dramatically at me. Her answer cut through the noise around her, sounding loud and clear. I was stunned. I don't think my chin fell, but it could have. I glanced at Mercedes. Her face was still flushed. She did not look at me. Maddie was delighted with the impact her words made. She smiled happily and repeated them several times, jumping on the spot and making faces at everyone. My children, of course, joined her. S-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s-s. I told them quietly, eat pizza and then we'll get ice cream. Thank God for the power of ice cream over small children. They immediately calmed down and took another slice of pizza. I looked at Mercedes sitting next to me who was still blushing slightly. I smiled, but it was a warm smile because the kids were so funny. For your information, I began, I tried to find you too, but my man couldn't. You just disappeared. Were you looking for me? She was surprised. She looked into my eyes her blush starting to fade. I read that you're getting a divorce, I said hesitantly. I didn't want it to look like I was following her. I tried to reach you, but I couldn't find any phone numbers, so I hired a private investigator, but he could only get in so far. He lost track of you somewhere in Billings, Montana, I think. She grinned. Well, my uncle rants far. Great uncle Walter rants far picked us up and took us to his house in Wyoming. Maddie and I lived there for a while with him and his girlfriend because Reggie, my ex, acted like an ass. We needed to hide somewhere quiet. It worked, I praised with a smile. The private detective said it was like you fell from the edge of the earth. I'm really glad you came, I continued. How long will you stay this time? Mercedes studied my face carefully. She looked into my eyes carefully, as if she was looking for something. Then she slowly leaned towards me and quietly whispered, Until you kick us out. Instead of answering, I kissed her tenderly. 
Three pairs of bright eyes were watching us, of course. What does the song say? I said thoughtfully, never before the twelfth. I couldn't stop smiling. I kissed her again. We turned to the children, who had been carefully watching us all this time, but did not interrupt. They were busy munching on pizza. Obviously, they all really wanted ice cream and tried to behave. Mercedes and I finished our pizza, holding each other's hands under the table. Neither she nor I were about to let go. Where are you staying? I asked. I intended to move them to the ranch as soon as possible. I didn't even argue with myself. Perhaps Mercedes had a different opinion on this matter, but I was confident that I could persuade her if she did not want to live with us and my children. Mercedes laughed and glanced out the window. We just arrived, me, Maddie, and my private investigator. We were heading to a hotel nearby when we saw your truck. He knew what it looked like, and I told him to turn here, she explained, laughing again. He's sitting in his car right now in the parking lot with our suitcases in the trunk. I laughed. Mercedes and I were like two teenagers. It seemed to me that resuming our relationship, which was once interrupted, should be more difficult, but everything went like clockwork. It was incredibly nice. Would you like to stay at the ranch with us? I suggested quietly. Are you still living there? I thought. I nodded. It's kind of like that the same plot, but a new house, I explained. Can Joe, his name is Joe Conway, ask him to put our stuff in your truck? Mercedes asked without hesitation, without even thinking about whether it was right to stay at my ranch. I took out the remote control and pressed the button, opening the doors and tailgate of the truck through the large window. I only have two child seats, I was warned. Don't worry, Mercedes interjected. I brought Maddie's seat with me from Cheyenne Country. She took out her phone. Joe, it's Mercedes, listen, would you kindly put our things in Matt's truck, please? She asked. To the luggage compartment. She looked at me. Let him put them in the back of the truck, I prompted. I got an idea. Tell him that we will pay extra for his services, okay? I thought that was fair private detectives don't usually carry suitcases or install child seats. Dad, my son Tom turned to me. I raised my eyebrows to indicate that I was listening. Maddie and, uh, said Ace, he said, looking at Mercedes. Are they going to live with us? He finished. I think so, I answered calmly. Mercedes has been my friend for a long time, and I think Maddie will become my friend too. And maybe they will become friends for you and Judy. What do you say? Tom shrugged it wasn't that important to him. Okay, he said, blessing the whole plan. Hooray, Judy screamed delightedly. New friends were great news for her. She stopped, thought about it, and turned to Maddie. Do you want to ride horses? Maddie's eyes widened. Horses, she exclaimed, clearly delighted with the very idea. She nodded enthusiastically. The plates of pizza were finally finished almost. There were crusts left and a lonely piece of mushroom. None of the children liked it, which lay in the middle of one of the plates. That was all. The ice cream was eaten to the last, and each of the children licked their fingers. After that, they made a final run towards the new games. Before he left, Joe installed Maddie's baby seat between Tom and Judy's, which I thought was cute. Tom's seat was still on the driver's side, directly behind me right where he wanted it. Judy didn't care, so it was perfect for the three guys. Of course, all three of us fell asleep about two or three minutes after we left the parking lot. I pre-ordered a conversion on my new truck to include wide, very comfortable benches front and rear. I noticed Mercedes looking at the trio, sleeping in the back seat with a gentle smile. When they fell asleep, she unbuckled her seat belt and slid into the seat closer to me, touching shoulder and thigh. If these aren't the cutest kids in the world, I don't know what is, she said. I glanced briefly in the rearview mirror. I couldn't agree more. Three adorable children, and two of them were mine. Baby. Mercedes said quietly, I'm so sorry. About Sharon, she added, it was so sad. She was a wonderful woman, I replied. She was a great wife and a great mother. But she suffered so much before she died. It was hard for Judy and Tom, 
but we had a lot of time to prepare for it, and now we are slowly moving on. Mercedes patted my hand and kissed my cheek. I have a message for you from Sharon, I said after a pause. Mercedes shuddered and tensed slightly. A message from a dead wife could confuse anyone. I glanced at her. Well, not exactly straight from her, I added to lighten the mood. I looked again at the road ahead. A few months before she died, Sharon kicked all the doctors and nurses out of the room and made me lie next to her on the hospital bed so she could talk without any effort. I pointed to a building on the side of the road that we passed. It was Jessie's barbecue where Mercedes and I met. She recognized him immediately. Oh, oh, honey, we just have to go back there. Real soon, okay, she said enthusiastically. I noticed that she started calling me darling again, like she used to before we broke up. I liked it. It was like coming home. We'll definitely be back, I assured her, patting her on the thigh. Necessarily. So, Sharon told me that when she was gone, she wanted me to find a woman who would love me and our children. She made me promise that, I continued. Mercedes lowered her eyes, studying her hands in her lap. So, I continued, I don't want to scare you, but my dear wife made me promise to love and be loved me and our children. So if this is not what you want, if this will be like last time. Stop, Mercedes said sharply, pointing to a roadside park that was visible ahead. I managed to break and swerve without waking the children. A cloud of Texas dust covered us. Mercedes turned to me, wrapped her arms around my neck, and kissed me. I want you. I love you. And I will never leave you, she vowed. I'm serious I'll be by your side until you kick me out. Understand, Matthew James? I kissed her back and hugged her. You said that L word. I whispered, we never said this last time, even when I wanted to. I know, she answered quietly. I wanted to say that too, but if we had done it then, we would not have been able to part and do what we had to do. My words sounded restrained, but full of emotions. But this time, Dawn calling Dove, that was her name among the Cheyenne, I'll say it every morning, noon and evening, so if you're not ready for tell, she insisted. I love you, I answered immediately. I love you. And I love you, she whispered, sighing happily and resting her cheek on my shoulder. We sat like that for a few more minutes, enjoying the warmth of hugs and the tenderness of kisses, but were silent. We didn't need to talk, everything was clear, and so, our relationship, which had been broken many years ago, seemed to be picked up where it had left off. We felt incredibly comfortable with each other and seemed to be taking on new responsibilities without words. After their short nap on the way back, the three children predictably woke up full of energy, ready for new adventures. They wanted to do everything at once. When the horses neighed near the corral, the question of what to do first was decided. Mercedes and I led them down to the stables, taking with us a bag of apples. The children happily fed the horses while I saddled the ponies for my children. I had two Shetland ponies for Tom and Judy and already had my eye on another for Maddie. When I told her about it, she was delighted and gave me hugs and kisses. Judy rode her pony around the paddock on her own, something she had been able to do for almost a month now, and she was very proud of herself. I placed Maddie on the pony behind Tom and my son led his new friend in a long circle. Three-year-old Maddie held tight to Tom's waist as he confidently led his Shetland. After a while, Tom returned and asked that Maddie be moved in front of him so that she could see where they were going. Maddie was delighted. She hugged Tom and kissed him on the cheek. At first he was embarrassed, but decided that it could be compared to his sister's kisses he could endure it, but he didn't have to respond to them. After riding, the children wanted to swim. We took the ponies back to the stable, watered and groomed them, and then turned them out to pasture. I set up a running race so the kids could be the first to get into the house and change into their swimsuits. I suggested that Mercedes unpack their things while I looked after the kids at the pool, but she flatly refused. Instead, she pulled out swimsuits for herself and Maddie, and we all headed out to the backyard, where the kids were frolicking in the small pool under the bright sun. 
As the sun began to set, I fired up the grill and cooked some steaks for Mercedes and I and chicken tenders for the kids. In addition to this, I baked potatoes and fried some asparagus and vegetables to at least somehow balance our diet. After dinner, three children with some remaining energy ran around the yard, catching fireflies. When it was time to go to bed, they were already on the verge of complete exhaustion. Mercedes and I helped them shower. My kids went to the bathroom in my bedroom, and Mercedes took Maddie to the bathroom in their new room. Everything went according to my well-thought-out plan. I wanted all three kids to be completely exhausted so they could sleep through the night without waking up. Mercedes and I walked from my children's bedroom door to Maddie's bedroom, watching them as they slept. I put my arm around her waist, no longer even pretending that we were just the friends we talked about when we were young. It seems to me that when angels are mentioned in the Bible, I said, they used a sleeping child as a model. I smiled. She gracefully moved from my side in front of me and wrapped both arms around me. We kissed privately for the first time since she and Steffi left me all those years ago. We both knew that three pairs of eyes were watching us closely. In her room, Mercedes opened another suitcase and took out a nightgown, after which we walked down the corridor to what was my bedroom. Now she was ours. We didn't even discuss it. We spent the night together. Everything went great. Mercedes got up a little before dawn, put on her nightgown and went to her room, where she hadn't even unpacked her luggage yet. We maintained the appearance of sleeping separately for almost three weeks. Mercedes got up early to go back to her bed, but one day her alarm didn't go off. The first thing we noticed was when all three kids climbed into our bed and demanded that someone get up and make breakfast. They didn't care who exactly made the pancakes and sausages, but it had to be done quickly so that they had time to watch the cartoons. Mercedes was in a nightgown and I was in boxers. We were lucky that we managed to get dressed before we fell asleep. I didn't even want to imagine what would have happened if they found us naked too many questions. I decided to change the batteries in the baby monitors and turn up the volume so that we would at least have a chance of getting a warning in advance. After we got caught, Mercedes officially moved into the master bedroom with me. To our surprise, neither of the children seemed at all concerned that Mama Maddie slept with Daddy Tommy and Judy every night. This didn't bother them at all. We expected there to be a lot of anxiety and confusion. Encouraged by this, after seeing how easily they accepted our closeness, Mercedes and I sat down with them and talked about moms and dads, explaining that we wanted me to be dad to all three and Mercedes to be mom to all three. I told Tommy and Judy that their mom was in heaven and would always look out for them, but I explained that Mercedes would be their mom who would take care of them every day. Judy and Tommy easily accepted the new state of affairs. They had already formed a close bond with Mercedes, just as she had with them. Maddie, whose father had been absent since her birth, asked only one thing. If you become my dad, will you still read me stories like you have been doing for the past few weeks? When she heard that I would read her even more fairy tales and never leave her, she absolutely agreed. We thought the conversation with our parents would be difficult and expected them to give us a lot of advice about taking our time, thinking things through, and making an informed decision something like that. We expected that there would be no open resistance, but perhaps there would be a little resistance. Since my parents were closest, we went to them first. Moments after mom and dad gave all three kids a quick hug, Maddie, Tommy, and Judy ran into the backyard. Tommy and Judy wanted to show Maddie the sandbox and swing set that dad built for my kids in the backyard. That left Mercedes and I drinking mom's lemonade and waiting for that conversation we knew was coming. Mom, I said, taking a long sip of lemonade, this is Mercedes, I added by way of introduction. We're going to get married, I added. I told Matt I didn't need to introduce myself to you, Mercedes chimed in before mom or dad could respond. We already met, Lee, via video call a few years ago. Matt introduced me to you even then, Mercedes continued. Do you remember? She asked her mother in a sweet voice. Mom was confused. I was sure that she was going to ask very serious questions, but she didn't have time. 
She looked closely at Mercedes. Ah, no, honey, I don't think. How about a pair of handcuffs? Hum, Mercedes asked cheerfully. Mom blinked and suddenly understood. Oh, damn, she exclaimed in embarrassment. She instantly blushed a very interesting shade of red. The girl in the mirror, Dad exclaimed, smiling. Dad stood up, walked over to Mercedes and formally shook her hand. It's very nice to meet you, young lady, he said with approval in his voice. Dad was on our side. He declared us a great couple and went to the kitchen to get more lemonade. When Mercedes revealed that she was half Cheyenne Indian, Mom and Dad were amazed. After Mercedes told how her father always said that he had captured the smiling Irish woman and her mother claimed that she had captured a warrior from the Cheyenne tribe, Mom and Dad were fascinated. After dinner, as the three children begged my dad to read them stories, it became clear that my parents were as captivated by my Indian girl and her daughter as I was. There were no comments that our relationship was developing too quickly. Our body language seemed to convince Mom that everything would be fine. By the time all the dishes were washed and put away for the evening, Mom and Dad were actively trying to get their third granddaughter to call them Grandma and Grandpa. And they did it without much effort. Since Maddie's paternal grandparents had always been distant from her, she easily accepted Tommy and Judy's grandparents. A week later, we flew to Philadelphia so Mercedes could introduce my kids and me to her parents. I was very glad to meet them. When I first met Mercedes many years ago, I thought I would enjoy meeting them, and I was right. After some hesitation on their part, Mercedes's divorce had been finalized less than two months ago, when she came to see me, they welcomed me and my children with open arms. We had a great time. I had a suspicion that Mercedes might have told her mother Fiona about the three weeks we spent together a long time ago. It seemed like she did it right after Mercedes left me, because Fiona gave me a big hug before we even officially met. By the time we left for home, Tommy and Judy had another set of loving grandparents determined to spoil them into oblivion. Mercedes called her ex-husband's parents to see if they wanted to see Maddie, but they refused. Well, so be it. The five of us flew to Anchorage to talk to Tommy and Judy's maternal grandparents. All three children had a wonderful time on board the plane, quickly winning the hearts of all the flight attendants in first class. All three received extra snacks, goodies, and lots of attention throughout the flight. While the flight attendants nursed them, Mom and Dad held hands and dozed. Everything went very well with Bruce and Judy, although I was worried beforehand. They both knew that Sharon had tasked me with finding a mother for my two children and someone I could love and be loved. They were surprised that I did it so quickly, but they accepted Mercedes and accepted her unconditionally. In general, meeting all the relatives went very, very well. Mercedes and I fit together like two interconnected puzzle pieces and have been that way from the very beginning. We never had a first date and went from just met to being completely involved, nothing flat. Since she returned, we immediately returned to a full-fledged relationship, all the while keeping a close eye on ourselves for problems. We couldn't find one. Encouraged, Mercedes and I got married a full three months after Mercedes and Maddie surprised me and my kids at a pizza place. Being married to Mercedes is an adventure, but a comfortable one. We agreed on many things, but we always had something to talk about. Whenever we found differences, we always discussed alternatives and chose a path together. Sometimes I adopted her views on this or that problem, and sometimes she came over to my side. Honestly, the worst things that bothered us were the moments when Mercedes got into a what-could-have-been mood. Sometimes Mercedes worried that she shouldn't have been so adamant about keeping her dance career front and center. She wondered where our relationship would have been if she hadn't left me to pursue her career. I took a more pragmatic point of view. First of all, what happened happened. It was all history and we couldn't change it. Secondly, we had three small children whom we would have loved differently and there was no way we could have regretted our children. We both knew that even if she didn't want to admit it, if she didn't stay with her dance troupe, she would regret it perhaps bitterly later. Any deep relationships we explored back then probably wouldn't have survived, probably wouldn't have survived, 
and we wouldn't be together now. Despite everything that happened to us, we are now married and have three wonderful children. We fell deeply in love and had a wonderful time with our blended family. We blended well with each other and easily got into our roles. Mercedes was the mother to all three children, and I was the father. We worked together to set boundaries and rules within the family. We taught the children through this experience what a loving relationship should be like every day. One of the things we did was have Mercedes, and I go on date nights every now and then quite often, actually. After all, we were newlyweds. My mom and dad, also known as grandparents, loved to invite the kids over for sleepovers and, on a couple of occasions, for entire weekends. Whenever they were unavailable, all three children were cared for by a pair of sisters. Many years ago, I sold the horse Ginger and another young mare to two teenage girls named Ingram who still lived near me. Amber and Pamela were already teenagers, just the right age to look after three adorable little children, and we got plenty of use out of them. We paid them damn well, too. Children often stayed in kindergarten for a week. I wanted them to do it, and I got Mercedes to agree. The preschool we chose was quite small with a great teacher-to-child ratio, so there was excellent supervision. We thought it was important for our three children to meet, play, and work on projects with other children. I think Tommy, Judy, and Maddie had a great time based on the stories they told Mercedes and me. I was pretty sure they learned a lot about how to get along with others and work together with them. Things were looking up very well. In fact, everything was damn near perfect. The overhead television monitors reported that the 318 flight from Philadelphia had even landed on time. Mercedes and I waited near the carousel, where the luggage would soon make its presence known. We were waiting for Mercedes' latest recruit at her dance school. She only told me that it was a woman she knew from a dance troupe who was also retiring. Mercedes retired due to an ankle injury and a long recovery. The injury was so severe that although the injury healed, the ankle was never again strong enough to withstand the constant stress of dancing on stage and the enormous number of hours of training. So now she was teaching and having a great time doing it. I absentmindedly watched the departing passengers in the long concourse check-in for their flights and wondered why all, or at least most of them, did not use the check-in kiosks set up throughout. It didn't make sense to me to wait in long lines instead of using the touchscreen method, but whatever. Hey, did someone say it's National Nude Flying Day? Asked in a soft voice behind my left shoulder. I winced, my shoulders hunched defensively as I turned around to find. Stephanie, I gasped. Oh my God, what are you doing? I glanced at my dear wife, who was smiling smugly at me a few steps away. I was set up. I'll deal with this later when we're not in the main hall of the international airport. I turned to Stephanie, took her hands in mine, and kept her at a distance. A few years have not diminished the effect that this blonde, big-breasted, long-legged woman had on me, and on every man in sight, and on quite a few women as well. I should have known, I remarked, and I really should have known. Come on, new dance teacher, and from Philadelphia. I just didn't pay attention. It's good to see you, I said to Stephanie and kissed her left cheek. And who is this, I asked, taking a big step back, hidden behind Stephanie's left leg, which I noticed was bare under a skirt that only reached mid-thigh, was a small clone of Stephanie. This is Daphne Daphne Darling. Can you say hello to Matt? I squatted down so I was at eye level with the little girl, obviously Stephanie's daughter. Smiling, I extended my hand. I'm very pleased to meet you, Daphne. Did your mother tell you that she and I were friends a long time ago? The little cuckoo nodded hesitantly and then grinned. Without warning, she closed the distance between us, wrapped her arms around my neck and hugged me. I didn't expect this, so she almost knocked me over. I had to save myself by quickly slamming my left hand behind me onto the full marble floor. Sitting back on my heels, I placed my hands on her waist and pulled her towards me to return her hug and lightly kiss her cheek. So, let's play the question game that all adults do, I suggested. How old are you? She held up four fingers and smiled happily. What is your name? Daphne Mercedes Walton, she answered cheerfully. 
I glanced quickly at Mercedes. Do you know this lady? I asked, pointing to my wife. Daphne nodded vigorously. Aunt Mercedes, she answered. I think Aunt Mercedes needs a hug too, don't you? I told her. The girl nodded vigorously again and ran towards Mercedes. My wife bent down to pick her up, and they hugged tightly. As I stood up, Stephanie came over to me, put her arm around my waist, and pressed me a little longer than before. I missed you, Matt, she whispered. She kissed me tenderly, squeezed me tighter, and released me to go over to Mercedes. Three women, one adult and two small, hugged the three of them, doing it as sincerely as if they had never parted. Then the warning signal sounded and the baggage carousel began to move, delivering suitcases. Stephanie pointed at her and Daphne's bags as they passed us, and I quickly grabbed them and pulled them off the belt. Stephanie and Mercedes each took one large suitcase and wheeled them towards the exit, while I was dragging behind me two huge duffel bags, fortunately, they had wheels. Little Daphne put a tiny pink backpack with pictures of bunnies on her back and walked next to us to the temporary parking lot. I loaded everything into the back of the pickup truck, got behind the wheel, and adjusted the waist belt that held my Glock. There shouldn't have been any danger at the airport, of course, but who knows? I started the car and turned on the air conditioner. Mercedes and Stephanie were already deep in conversation, and little Daphne listened with genuine interest. So where are we going? I asked. Although in fact he already knew the answer. The guest room is ready, Mercedes answered calmly. I had no doubts, I just wanted to make sure. At home, Daphne met Maddie and met Tommy and Judy, who accepted the new girl without any hesitation. Tommy just asked if I had any friends with little boys, but he didn't seem upset. Within minutes, all four children ran to the playground we had built in the yard. Mercedes and Stephanie continued their endless conversation while I sat on the terrace to watch the children play. Well, tell me, I said to Mercedes when she could no longer escape me. We were in bed. Oh, Steffi, she asked with an innocent look. Oh, Steffi, I answered firmly. What's happening? She needed a job. I had a job for her. She's like a little sister to me, you know that. I love her. I want her to work with me in the studio. She agreed, came here, and I want her to live with us, so that my sister is close, okay? Mercedes blurted out in one breath. There was nothing threatening in her answer. It was obvious that she had thought this all through in advance. Actually, this didn't surprise me at all. But... The last time you brought Stephanie to the ranch, it was to drive a wedge between us, I said bluntly. Is there any reason why you want to separate us now? Mercedes laughed. She was absolutely calm. She put her hands on my neck and pulled me towards her for a long kiss. It didn't work very well then, did it? She whispered softly. You and Steffi got really close back then, and we ended up being like the three musketeers, right? Well, not really. Back then, the three of us were actually sexually involved with each other for two of the three weeks I spent with Mercedes. I don't remember that Alexander Dumas's musketeers had such adventures. I shifted uncomfortably on the bed. Mercedes, I began. We are now married and not free, not attached, and I don't even know what to call it. Irresponsible or what? We can't just... I was relieved that Stephanie wasn't trying to destroy Mercedes and my marriage, but the other options were also a minefield that required careful navigating. S-H-H-H, Mercedes whispered in my ear. Steffi came here to work with me in the dance studio, and I adore her. I want her to be around. She will become a good friend for you too, dear. She won't interfere with us in any way. Understand? I didn't answer right away. I was still thinking about her words because I wasn't quite sure. Mercedes moved closer to me. And just like that, I couldn't ask any more questions. It worked. It worked very well. We became Mercedes' version of the Three Musketeers again, resuming our relationship from those long-ago days, but now without sex. Mercedes and I were an ordinary married couple, and Stephanie was our guest. Well, as a guest, she did a lot of housework like everyone else. We shared all the responsibilities and other things that needed to be done around the house. Since we did not have a ranch, there were few tasks outside the home. 
Usually I did them, but often women also helped me. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, Mercedes and Stephanie drove in her SUV to the dance studio, where they taught classes for adults. On Tuesday and Thursday evenings, they taught classes for children after school. I made breakfast for our four children, dressed them for daycare if I had to go to the office, or in home clothes if we had a free day. If the weather allowed, the children spent most of the morning outside. They liked it when I was on the terrace where they could see me and I could watch them play. Sometimes they even involved me in their fantasies where I played one role or another. After an early dinner on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would drive all four of them to the studio where they would join their age group classes. Tommy wasn't too excited about the dance lessons, but the three girls were absolutely thrilled to be learning to dance with Mercedes and Stephanie. Tommy endured it and at times even seemed to enjoy it. We kept things routine, but at the same time tried to keep things spontaneity and freshness in our relationships. Our dates with Mercedes often expanded to include Stephanie, and the three of us would go out to dinner, dancing, concerts, or just to the movies. We also became slightly involved in local charity movements. We were invited to a ball at Kyle Mulvane's house to raise funds for the preservation of a number of local historical sites. It was joked that the Mulvane family owned half of the southwest part of the city and had plans to buy the rest. According to the majority and themselves, they were considered the movers and initiators in the big city. I was invited with one companion, but I got out and got another invitation so that Stephanie could come with us. The event required a dress code, black tie. Mercedes and Stephanie wore long evening dresses. The color of Mercedes' dress was sea foam, I would call it gray-green. The dress was off the shoulder and had a slit on the left front side that showed off her long, slender leg with every step. It looked absolutely gorgeous on her. Stephanie's dress was a rich royal blue that went well with her blonde hair and striking appearance. The dress had a deep V neckline that accentuated her breasts to the fullest. The slit on her dress was also on the left side, revealing her slender legs. I was the ugly duckling of our little trio in a black tuxedo, white shirt, and black bow tie. Instead of a regular belt, I wore a wide sash, which helped hide the mark of the Glock 38, which I carried in a hidden holster under my clothes. I thought about leaving my .45 at home, but I didn't feel comfortable without it. I had a concealed carry permit for a long time, and now I felt even more of a need to protect my children and the women in our extended family. One of the first things I did after returning to Texas from Alaska was renew my concealed weapons permit. When we entered the hall, we received a lot of attention, mainly because both my ladies were strikingly beautiful in their outfits. We attracted even more attention when we started dancing. Mercedes and Stephanie loved to dance. They had been dancing professionally for many years, and now they taught it in their studio on the west side of the city. Moreover, they wanted me to enjoy dancing too. I knew enough to be able to move my feet across the floor and hold a beautiful woman while dancing before I even met Mercedes and Stephanie, but they took my skills to the next level during the short time we were first together. Even though I considered myself someone who was born with two left feet, they managed to get more out of me than I expected. They even came up with a new dance step designed to allow two women and one man to dance together comfortably. I thought of myself as just a prop that they used to show off their dancing skills. In my opinion, they could have used a mannequin from the store instead of me, but I could move, so they chose me. What we did was adapted from one of the numbers they performed while touring with the troupe. The three of us were always on the move and always in close contact with each other. After months of practice, I was just beginning to gain the confidence on the dance floor to begin to enjoy holding one woman and then another in my arms, twirling around each other in an intricate pattern. It was fun and I enjoyed it immensely. Who wouldn't enjoy it? I was the center of attention with two beautiful women dancing around me. Apparently, it looked good too. We attracted more and more interest the longer we danced. I didn't realize it but we moved very close to the small stage where the band was playing. When the number ended, I noticed how the orchestra conductor smiled at us and silently applauded, pointing behind me. 
When I turned around, the dance floor for a few meters around us was empty. No one else was dancing. There was applause for our efforts. I bowed as gracefully as I could. Mercedes and Stephanie curtsied and smiled sweetly. We headed towards the bar. It was all fun, but dancing with these two was hard work. The girls were warmly welcomed into the group of men and women at one end of the long bar. Mercedes and Stephanie were greeted with wide, delighted smiles and showered with compliments. I decided to make myself useful and went to the other end of the bar to order two glasses of white wine for them and a bottle of flavored water for myself. As the bartender finished pouring the wine, I heard a noise from where I left my dance partners. Show them, bitch. Come on. You've been shining them all evening, showing them. So now. My head instantly turned. Stephanie was pestered by a short, stocky man who was all arrogant self-righteousness. I saw him grab her. I rushed towards her before I could even think about what I was doing. I must have run, but I didn't remember it. Time sometimes seems to slow down in moments of crisis. Suddenly, I found myself behind and slightly to the right of the man who had attacked Stephanie. I managed to catch her eye. She didn't look scared, she was just waiting for me to fix the situation. He was clearly defeated. I turned and found Stephanie, hugging her protectively. She pressed herself close to me, wrapping her arms tightly around my waist. Are you okay, honey? I asked quietly, pulling back a little to look at her face. She nodded and pressed her cheek to my chest, hugging me even tighter. After a moment, I stepped back a few inches, took off my tuxedo and draped it over Stephanie's shoulders to cover her. There was complete chaos around us. Some people asked in panic what was happening, while others tried to explain what they saw. Of course, not everyone saw what happened from the very beginning, and their explanations began to noticeably deviate from reality. I looked around for Mercedes. She was next to my right elbow, looking worried and a little worried. Mercedes picked up her phone. These days they are even taken to ballrooms. I filmed everything she shouted joyfully. I filmed everything. Her voice cut through the noise and silenced everyone for a moment. I nodded in understanding and pushed Stephanie forward, catching Mercedes' eye, and we began to move towards the wide staircase leading to the door we entered through. We were intercepted by a tall, massive man in a tuxedo, which was clearly too small for him. Mr. Mulvane would like to see the lady's phone, sir, he told me matter-of-factly, he pointed to the left. Mulvane stood at a high column. The expression on his face did not bode well. Judging by his appearance, he was worried, angry, and anxious all at the same time. But most of all, he was angry, completely furious. No. I answered briefly, but I don't think it sounded too aggressive. This won't happen. I tried to walk around the guy on the right. It was like walking around a small mountain, but he reached out and stopped me, placing his hand on my chest. He looked at Mercedes and made a hand gesture as if to say, give it here, while holding me with his other hand. I moved and his left hand grabbed my shoulder to hold me in place. Look down, I growled at him. I was in a foul mood. It didn't even occur to him to do this. He was confident that he was in control of the situation. I poked him in the stomach with the Glock I pulled from my holster. Look down, I warned him. He looked anyway, and with more intelligence than I gave him credit for, he immediately realized that the situation had changed. He didn't really control anything. He nodded. His hands slowly rose, revealing that they were empty. Do you have a weapon? I asked. He nodded. The little one behind my back, he explained. Get him, I ordered. Slowly, with your left hand, just your thumb and forefinger. He followed my order exactly, moving very carefully. Lie on your stomach, I ordered. He didn't hesitate and immediately lay down on the floor. Stephanie Mercedes. I motioned for the women to come around to my left side and lowered my right hand so that the muzzle of the gun was pointing down. My finger finally straightened along the frame of the gun so that an accidental movement would not lead to a shot. The three of us walked up the stairs, across the lobby, and out onto the street almost instantly. I threw the guard's weapon on the table in the foyer as I walked by. 
the SUV we were driving was driven into the driveway by an unsuspecting valet, and we drove away quietly. After this, things went smoothly for us. No one tried to contact us. Three city police cars passed us a couple of miles down the road, all traveling in the opposite direction at high speed. However, they did not pay any attention to us. Our trip to Macready Airfield was uneventful. I owned the airfield for almost a year, but left the name untouched. Many of the weekend flyers who were my best clients recognized the place by the old name and used it because they knew it. Within minutes of our arrival, our SUV was parked next to the hangar, and we were already aboard the twin-engine Cessna that flew into town. I started to take off while Mercedes and Stephanie were still buckling up. Forty-two minutes after we raised the wheels, the plane was already locked and tied down. A moment later, we were safe inside our castle ranch. With the security system we had, no one was going to bother us there. It certainly didn't end there. By noon the next day, big city detectives had identified all the players. They arranged for the sheriff of the county where we lived to interview us. In fact, there were enough of them to form a caravan of six cars that made its way through our gates and up to the main house. The sheriff himself came to our front door, literally with his hat in his hand. He knew that my father had been sheriff of this county during its most turbulent years, and he knew that most of the old guard in the county remembered those times and my father very well. When the current sheriff saw Dad standing at our front door, he was all polite, respectful, and polite. Inside, Stephanie, Mercedes, and I gave the city police the affidavits we had already prepared and answered their questions as they seemed to be sincerely trying to document the facts of what happened. We also gave them a copy of the video Mercedes took on her phone. The moment the most junior detective asked the gotcha question, one of our lawyers interrupted the questioning with a short remark that the three of us would not answer any more questions, now or ever. He made it stick, too. The young detective received several annoyed looks from his fellow police officers. One of the official entourages happened to be from the district attorney's office and apparently knew the entire legal team I had flown in to see that morning. When the detective glanced questioningly in her direction, she shrugged. There was nothing she could do. She knew my lawyers were good, they were better than just good, they were outstanding as they should be, considering how much I pay them. I hoped I would get my money's worth. Another group of my legal team was already at the Dawes office in town demanding to know why the idiot who attacked Stephanie wasn't already behind bars and charged with assault. He, too, should probably have been accused of mortal stupidity if such a charge had occurred. After three weeks and four days, it was all over. Doofus turned out to be Mr. Mulvaney's youngest son. Mulvane tried to defend his boy's behavior and even shift the blame to Stephanie. Our lawyers seized on this, leaving Mulvane and the city's lawyers to do what they will do to them in court for shaming the victims. Our lead lawyer seemed to be salivating at the thought of breaking them in the public arena. Mulvaney's team retreated, and once the retreat began, it snowballed downhill. Under pressure, the district attorney charged Doofus with three felonies and a number of misdemeanors. It turned out that in addition to the one taken by Mercedes, there were a dozen more videos of the incident, and none of them showed anything favorable to the Mulvaney's. Doofus eventually pleaded guilty to one charge, and was sentenced to six months in prison, avoiding heavy time in a Texas prison, but he still got a felony conviction on his record. The DA initially wanted to do the Mulvaney's a favor and charge him with a misdemeanor, but our attorneys made sure the local media was well informed of what was going on. The district attorney narrowly won his office in the last election, and he preferred not to have a wealthy opponent next time me, supporting his opponent on law and order issues. The Dawes office tried to make it sound like I was brandishing a gun, but we responded by suggesting that the giant bodyguard's actions constituted unlawful restraint and the use of potentially lethal force was appropriate. A video emerged of the monster placing its right hand on my chest, ending any suggestion that I might have acted indiscreetly. If the mountain man had actually confiscated Mercedes' phone, it would have opened another big can of worms theft obstruction, and tampering with evidence were among the worms mentioned. The prosecutor was wise to dismiss any suggestion 
that he might even consider bringing a case against me. My lawyers were disappointed. They saw a chance to get a ton of billable hours if the DAW actually moved forward. Stephanie's lawsuit against the Mulvaney's for creating a hostile environment, the lawyers said something similar, but I didn't listen too closely was settled immediately out of court to avoid more negative attention. Suddenly Stephanie became a millionaire, and Mulvane even paid her attorney's fees. Our legal team returned to Dallas, I stopped shelling out huge amounts of money for their services, and peace reigned on our ranch. I foolishly thought this would become a permanent condition. A few weeks later, my mom and dad came to pick up all four kids Stephanie's little girl, Daphne, had long since been adopted as one of my parents' grandchildren, and the whole group went on a long weekend camping trip to mom and dad's big wagon. I didn't consider sleeping in a nice bed in a big RV to be camping, but to each his own. Based on the video chat we had with them earlier in the evening, all the kids were excited. Mom and dad couldn't stop smiling. Having all four grandchildren to themselves, without their parents around, was their idea of heaven. I lay in bed and, since Mercedes was not with me, looked through the cable provider's premium movie channel listings to watch movies on the DVR and watch later. I relaxed and enjoyed not being on duty for any child-sized emergency that might erupt in the hallway without warning. The door to the hallway opened and Mercedes slipped inside. She surprised me. I thought she was in the master bathroom and must have entered the bedroom through that doorway and not from the hallway. I was doubly surprised when Stephanie walked into the bedroom right behind my wife. Both women were dressed in sheer black negligees that did not hide anything on their luxurious bodies. Matt, honey, we have a problem, Mercedes announced in a serious tone. I could almost hear Scooby-Doo saying, Roo Roo, somewhere nearby. Do, saying his signature, Ro Ro, is somewhere nearby. Mercedes sat on the bed on my right side and took the TV remote from me. Stephanie sat on the bed to the left, but made no move to approach me. She just sat there, beaming and looking amazing. I didn't know what was going on, but something was clearly brewing. Mercedes turned on the DVD player, scrolled through the menu, and selected a clip simply titled Stephanie, then pressed play. She clearly prepared everything in advance. Look at this, Mercedes said sternly. It was a video she took during the Mulvane incident. I was familiar with this video. I watched that same moron spinning on the screen. She didn't scream, although many around her did. And then I appear in the frame. I considered this a manifestation of maturity. My lawyers liked it too. It looked like there was no way to charge me. The video ended with me taking off my jacket and draping it over Stephanie's shoulders to cover her. Did you see this? Mercedes demanded, full of emotion. I wasn't sure what she meant other than the obvious. Yes, I've seen it before, I replied neutrally, not understanding what she was getting at. Mercedes restarted the video. Look here, Matt. Watch Steffi's face. Look into her eyes. I concentrated and began to look at Stephanie's face. Mercedes played it in slow motion. At first it seemed to me that everything was as it was, but then I noticed that Stephanie was not really looking at her attacker. Her gaze was not directed at his face or down at his hands, but in my direction. She watched me approach her. Mercedes paused the video as Stephanie turned her head and looked me in the eyes. I saw her then raise her arms and press herself against me as soon as I covered her. See? Mercedes said in a whisper. Steffi wasn't scared. She didn't look at him. She looked at you, knowing that you would come and save her. I looked at the video again, and it seemed exactly like that. Stephanie looked at me. She was not afraid. She was waiting for me to save her. I realized that Mercedes was right. She knew that her knight in shining armor would come to save her. Mercedes continued. She leaned towards me and kissed me tenderly on the lips. Honey, she's in love with you, and you know it, she finished softly. I took a deep breath. I couldn't deny what Mercedes said. And here's what Mrs. Stanley filmed on her phone. Mercedes added, anticipating my possible objection. She played another short clip. This time I was seen taking off my jacket, 
throwing it over Stephanie's shoulders and hugging her, trying to calm her down. When the clip reached the end, Mercedes rewinded it and stopped it at the moment when I was looking down at Stephanie. And darling, Mercedes whispered, you love her too. I didn't know what to answer. Everything she said was true, although I denied it for a long time. I couldn't refute what she was saying. The video proved everything. Sweetheart. I began in a choked voice, I would never. I trailed off, looking back at Stephanie. I didn't want to hurt her, but I needed to somehow convince my wife. Darling, Mercedes began as I tried to make sense of this difficult situation. I know that you would never cheat on me. You just aren't capable of it. But I started to object. Say ch -h 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 -h. I know. She kissed me and gently stroked my chest. Both women kissed my cheeks. Look at us, Matt, darling, Mercedes said calmly. Here, no one cheats on anyone. No one betrays anyone else. No one deceives. No one does anything in secret. Everything is in plain sight, right? She whispered softly. Stephanie rose onto her elbow and kissed me tenderly. When I didn't object, she did it again. I love you, Matt, she whispered. I have loved you since I met you, and I will always love you. See, Mercedes said softly from the other side. She loves you, I love her, she loves me, I love you, and you love me. And you love Steffi too, don't you, darling? I, yes, I do, I admitted, but... And since you caused Steffi's divorce, we need to fix all of this. You do realize that this is the case, right? I don't. Wait, how did I cause? I began to object. I wasn't even close. Because he wasn't you, and didn't know how to be you, Steffi replied softly. And I didn't know that I was looking for you all this time. It was very unfair to Danny, but I didn't know, and he didn't stand a chance. I was so sorry but for him and me everything was predetermined from the very beginning," said Steffi quietly with regret. But now I'm here with you and Mercedes, and I promise that we will be the most loving and the happiest trinity in the world. I took her at her word and realized that Mercedes was also sincere. But I took a deep breath. Then he exhaled a strangled sigh of surrender. Do you understand how difficult this will all be? I asked rhetorically. None of them listened to me, but I didn't mind. But we can handle it, darling. Everything will be just fine. And basically, it was like that. We sometimes argued both women were strong and strong-willed individuals, and I could be stubborn too. But we made an ironclad agreement to always talk to each other and never let problems drag on. We never went to bed arguing. Sometimes we stayed until very late, but in the end everything was resolved before the lights went out. The three of us made love, and sometimes the two of us. We realized that the three of us needed a lot of time with each other, perhaps more than the average couple. We solved this dilemma by allowing mom and dad or our teen babysitters to watch the four kids frequently. My parents loved all four children and wanted to see them often and for increasingly longer periods of time. When mom and dad needed a break or had some errands to attend to, we used Amber and Pamela to babysit the kids. They were paid well and they loved our children to death. When Pam left for college and Amber succumbed to the charms of a local boy and married him in a traditional June wedding, they referred us to other girls in the area who would occasionally leave the children with us for a night or a weekend. In fact, we had an endless supply of nannies and made extensive use of them. Before the first child entered primary school, I adopted Maddie and Daphne. Maddie was named after me. Mercedes' husband never knew this, but he didn't really care. He never wanted children and did not want to be a father. He agreed to give up all parental rights without coaxing. Daphne's ex agreed to do the same, in part because he had met a woman and felt he should focus on starting a family with her. He didn't have the money to visit Daphne regularly, and their relationship was dying a slow death. I was surprised when Steffi and then Mercedes wanted to have more children. I thought four children was enough. They convinced me through discussion, and anything less than that means how wrong I was. Steffi had another little girl and Mercedes had a boy a couple of years after we became a loving trio, 
Then Steffi gave us a boy and Mercedes another girl. I loved them all. My life is filled with the love of my ladies and all the children around us. I looked down the hill and saw my son Tommy and the two older girls walking into the big house, probably for dinner, although they were a little early for that. Mercedes handed me a still-filled glass of iced tea, and the three of us sat on the veranda, enjoying the cool of the early evening. Tommy grew up to be a more muscular version of me, but you could see his mother in the shape of his nose, and sometimes the seriousness in his eyes. Seventeen-year-old Maddie was a sweet and bubbly clone of her mother Mercedes, while Daphne had all of Steffi's grace and beauty, as well as her large breasts. Tommy and Daphne were already attending the University of Texas M, and Maddie began studying there in the fall. My daughter Judy wanted to become a pediatrician and was a pre-med student at TCU, but she was home with us for a few weeks between semesters. Judy was in the backyard keeping an eye on all four of the younger children who were playing there. I heard their delighted squeals and screams. When I was a teenager younger than our older children are today my mom and dad let me stay alone in the house from which our trio of children had just moved out. When the time came, I convinced Mercedes and Steffi that doing the same with our older children was a good way to teach responsibility and resourcefulness and gradually introduce them into adulthood. I thought my idea worked quite well. The four of them said about housekeeping the latest version of the house had many bedrooms and everyone seemed happy. The children had a degree of independence that they valued, and this gave us adults some space to raise our younger offspring. Not having to listen to the latest incomprehensible madness of what their generation called music was a definite plus in my life. I watched as Tommy, Daphne, and Maddie confidently walked up the asphalt towards us. The plowed field on which I brought myself to condition, of course, was no longer there for a long time. Now it was just a meadow. The two girls and Tommy walked hand in hand. They stopped. Tommy and Maddie deliberately turned to face each other. Well, shit, I exclaimed. What our children were trying to tell us was unmistakable. The young people began to move again. Tommy wrapped his right arm around Maddie's upper body and his left around Daphne's. The young women hugged him just as tightly. Mercedes giggled next to me. I told you he'd figure it out sooner or later, she said, leaning across my body to talk to Steffi. Steffi's loud giggle answered Mercedes. It took him long enough, didn't it? Obviously, I was a little blind to some of the things going on around me. Dad. Tom told me as the three of them approached the porch. He was not so much defiant as serious. The girls kissed me on the cheek and stood waiting. They smiled tenderly. I looked at the three. I tried to put on a sinister expression, but it didn't work, so I gave it up. You all understand how damn confusing and difficult this is going to be, right? I asked, looking at them all in turn. I was looking for some kind of embarrassment or grief, but I didn't find it. Yes. They said in one voice. They smiled again. The girls walked up the steps to join hands with their mothers. But Mommy and I will always help us in difficult situations, Daddy, Maddie said quietly and confidently. I let the air rush out of my lungs. There was no point in fighting with a stacked deck. Well, come inside and wash up for dinner, I said, standing up and heading to the front door. I hugged Tom and each of the young women as they walked past me into the living room. I watched them disappear inside. I sighed. I really never wanted them to grow up, but here it is. My two mistresses, my wives, came up to me, held me in their arms for a long time, and kissed me again and again. After a while, I opened the screen door and let them inside. I closed the screen door behind me and walked around the house looking for our babies in the backyard. I wanted to hug and play with them until they grew up too. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.